Notre Dame is indeed blessed to have had, throughout its history, visionary and forward-looking presidents. All have guided it creatively through myriad seasons of growth and change. Our keynote speaker, the Reverend John Jenkins, is the 17th member of the Congregation of Holy Cross to serve in this capacity. Now in his third five-year term, Father Jenkins has made creation of a diverse, inclusive, and welcoming campus environment one of his major priorities. In 2013, he brought campus leaders together from Human Resources, Student Affairs, and the Provost's Office to be part of a Presidential Oversight Committee, of which he is chair. That Oversight Committee is charged with spearheading all of the university's locally administered diversity and inclusion initiatives. Today's luncheon and Walk the Walk Week reflect his dedication to Dr. King's values as well as his commitment to help Notre Dame become more fully a beloved campus community. Though much work is yet to be done, under his leadership and that of the committee, positive progress has been made and even more is envisioned for the future. Therefore, please join me in extending a warm welcome to our president, Father John Jenkins. Welcome everyone on such a cold day. It's great to feel the warmth and enthusiasm of this room. I want to thank each and every one of you for giving your time and your hearts to this day to celebrate the legacy of Dr. King and what we can do at Notre Dame. You know, I once heard the story of a preacher who gave a sermon on the sinfulness of our fallen human nature. As his sermon reached its crescendo, he posed the rhetorical question, does anyone among us claim to come even close to the perfection of our Lord Jesus Christ? Indeed, he continued, does anyone even know of a person who has reached that level of perfection? As he paused, he looked up, and he saw a hand go up in the back of the church. A bit nonplussed, the preacher recovered himself and said, I see that someone thinks they know a person who is almost Christ-like in his perfection. Pray, sir, stand up and tell us who this person is. The whole congregation turned and sat silently as a man sheepishly stood up. Yes, preacher, he said, I believe I know of such a person. It is the man my mother-in-law wishes her daughter had married. <laughs> None of us is perfect, and our imperfection is put in bold relief when it's compared to an imagined ideal. And when it comes to the issues that concern us today, each of us is indeed imperfect. And collectively, our Notre Dame community, our city, our nation, and our world are far from perfect. Today, 87 years after the birth of Martin Luther King Jr. and a half century after his assass assassination, and despite the civil rights advances since that time, we are still a very long way from the perfect racial harmony he and his companions sought. Now, there's no question that great strides have been achieved through civil rights legislation central to King's legacy, strides that cross borders and oceans in ways Dr. King could not have anticipated and sadly would not live to witness. People suppressed because of their race or their ethnicity or their religion in distant parts of the world, from South Africa to Northern Ireland, 
found inspiration in Dr. King. Looking back on her own experience, the formidable Irish civil rights activist Bernadette, Bernadette Devlin said, in 1968, I was 19 years old. I was not a revolutionary or a socialist then. I was not even a militant. I was a young Catholic student who simply wanted equality before the law and equality within the system. Our inspiration to take to the streets in peaceful mass protests came directly from Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. And in his acceptance speech on winning the Nobel Prize, Nelson Mandela, who had never met Dr. King, nonetheless quoted from King's own Nobel acceptance speech three decades earlier when he said that humanity can no longer be tragically bound to the starless midnight of racism and war. Dr. King accomplished much and inspired many. Yet the enemy he battled has not been vanquished. For the roots of racism, bigotry, and the kinds of exclusion he stood against go beyond the circumstances of the particular history of a particular nation at a particular time. The tap root of these evils is the tendency in all our hearts to identify with a group with which we are comfortable celebrate its virtues and remain blind to its shortcomings. And most insidiously, to cast those different in race, religion, ethnicity, geographic region, or anything else as somehow other. Not a member of our community. Not worthy of inclusion. Indeed, as a threat. These dark tendencies transcend time, people, and place. And it is these tendencies in all our hearts, individually and collectively, that we stand against today. Part of the battle against these tendencies is indeed about law, regulations, or policy that encourages some behaviors and punishes others. King recognized both the limitations and importance of law. He said, it may be true that the law cannot make a man love me, but it can stop him from lynching me, and that's pretty important. But it would be naive to conclude that the de jure protections against discrimination in housing, employment, and other important aspects of American life that grew from Dr. King and the civil rights movement had de facto eliminated big bigotry in all its forms. And yet, Dr. King was right. The law is important, even if it does not have the power to infuse the heart with love. At Notre Dame, however, we cannot be satisfied with waging the battle on the front of law and regulations alone. We strive not simply for just laws, but also, by God's grace, for hearts formed in the justice of God. As a Catholic university inspired by Christ, our struggle is to wage war on the tendencies toward exclusion and derision in each of our hearts, and to build a community of genuine love and respect for every member. A lesser goal would neither be worthy of Dr. Martin Luther King nor the University of Notre Dame. Many might, with a condescending smile, dismiss such an aspiration as quaintly naive. Dr. King did not. He did not because he was a man of faith, and his hope was anchored in that faith. As he said, the God whom we worship is not a weak or incompetent God. The ringing testimony of the Christian faith is that God is able. 
God is indeed able if we open our hearts to his power. And so here today, even as we recognize our own shortcomings, let us pray for open hearts and dare to say that our goal at Notre Dame is to follow Dr. King's call to build an inclusive community sustained not simply by tolerance, but by love. As Dr. Page mentioned, a beloved community. For it is love that can change the darker tendencies in our hearts and in those around us. There is a reason, Dr. King pointed out, that Jesus said, love your enemies. It changes their hearts as well as ours. As he put it, love has within it a redemptive power. And there is a power that eventually transforms individuals. Ironically, for all the terrible struggles and astounding accomplishments of Dr. King and his companions in changing segregationist laws or customs, they may have had the easier task. In that case, the evil is so clear and the goal is so well defined. Yet the obstacles to building a community of love and respect are usually not so overt as that. There are often comments in passing or casual actions that even unintentionally demean others and tear the bonds of community. Perhaps an important first step is simply a commitment by each one of us to listen well and with empathy, to speak gently but honestly, so that what we say and do in our day-to-day -day lives builds the kind of community we want rather than undermines it. We will continue to strive to recruit a diverse student body, faculty, and staff. Yet the mere gathering of a diverse group has no value unless the group is a community in which the gifts of each individual enrich the lives of every individual. Our goal is not simply to be a collection of talented, good, dedicated individuals from diverse backgrounds. Our goal is to come together in a community characterized by mutual love and respect. We are proud of the progress we've made, but we have much more work to do. Last night, we planned a march to begin this commemoration, though it had to be shortened because of the cold to a march to and from the main building. But even a short march reminds us of the many famous marches Dr. King led in his life, from Selma to Montgomery, Alabama, to the Lincoln Memorial in Washington, D.C. Marches suggest a journey of purpose we take together. This is an image we should all keep in mind. For the success we seek is not a destination, but a journey, a journey we must travel together let each of us in this community commit ourselves to walking the walk on that journey. And as Dr. King said, if you can't walk, then crawl. But whatever you do, you have to keep moving forward. And so, friends, let's march together. Let's each of us commit to walking the walk. Inspired by Dr. King, we invoke the power of God, the strength of Christ, the intercession of Notre Dame, Our Lady, as we walk the walk of this journey. Let's move forward together. Thank you.
Thank you, Father Jenkins, for your inspiring remarks and for your leadership. We look forward to joining you on that journey to advance Dr. King's vision in the days ahead. It is now my pleasure to welcome to the stage Dr. John McGreevy, Dean of the College of Arts and Letters and a group of esteemed faculty, student, and alumni panelists. As they take their places, I direct your attention to our video screens. During the past few weeks, members of our Notre Dame community were asked to comment on diversity and inclusion as it relates to our campus. Their comments provide an important context for our upcoming discussion. Here is what they had to say. I know normally we talk about um, diversity, whether it's religious or race or just um, socioeconomic background, it can be a touchy subject, kind of controversial, so some people um, stray away from it, but I feel like we're never really going to fix the um, issues that we have if we're afraid to talk about it. So I'm always open to conversation, trying to hear different viewpoints and trying to see, um, find similarities and commonalities um, more than differences. Back in 19, uh, 1944, we, Notre Dame introduced, uh, admitted its first African-American student by accident because the Navy thought he was white. And um, since then, we've come a long, long way. Um, this past year, I think our, our incoming class was 30% students of color. Uh, back in 2012, we had the, the four to five movement of students on campus. And uh, coming from that, the new LGBT student group, PRISM ND. The students change over time and they actually change every single semester. But what I find is more recently students are um, challenged in the way, in, in their knowledge. Number one, they're young. Of course they're young. Um, and so they did not live through the Civil Rights Movement. There's no way possible. Their parents barely lived through the Civil Rights Movement. So part of my responsibility is to open up their knowledge of American political history, um, the experiences of a variety of groups, and how difficult it was for so many different types of people. I am an assistant director for Multicultural Ministries, and so the heart of what I do is helping students who come from different backgrounds, Latino, African, African American, um, Asian, uh, different faith backgrounds, interfaith backgrounds, and helping them find their home at Notre Dame um, and celebrating that identity. It can be difficult for students who come um, to the Midwest for the very first time. And so that is my next step, is helping students find their home here and helping them find their identity here at the university. I think opening the campus to women was a big step towards diversifying, but I also think that the many scholarships and the financial aid that they offer helps to diversify, uh, opening up opportunities for students that ordinarily wouldn't get the chance to go to Notre Dame. Well, one thing that I, I don't think anyone else in the country is doing is the, the in-depth uh, multicultural competency training, um, and not just the content of the actual training, but the, the vast number of people who are going through the training. Over 2,000 people will, will be trained in the next year, and I think that's um, it's very, I guess, um, ambitious, but it, it's also very comprehensive, and I don't know any other university that's doing that. While we've made a lot of progress in becoming more diverse and inclusive, I think we ha still have a long ways to go. Uh, for example, in, in my college, um, women comprise about 32% of the student body, which is really good compared to the national average of about 20% in engineering, but we still have a long ways to go. It'd, it'd be nice to be much more diverse. Uh, we've also made progress with students of color. We're, we're 20 percent or more students of color, but we still have a long ways to go. Um, on the faculty side, I think we have a lot more progress to make. Um, we're about 13 percent women, and we have a tiny percentage of Latino, Latina, African American, and Native American faculty. Um, and I do think there are still some hidden, uh, maybe unintentional uh, biases about women in the academy and and underrepresented minorities in the academy. But I'm also very hopeful. Uh, again, I, I think uh, Notre Dame has a real spirit of inclusion that's really coming to the, to the forefront now. Notre Dame's really taken a great first step by making sure that, um, really paying attention to detail. So 
Now we have halal food in the dining hall, which is special preference of food for Muslim students. And we also have the Moreau First Year Experience course, which has been great because when I was a freshman um, in the sciences, I didn't really get exposed to classes about race. And so now race is hitting the classroom um, from the start. And it might make people feel uncomfortable at first, but it's great because people are talking about it. Um, and that's something that I think is a great step that Notre Dame has taken. Another thing about Notre Dame's unique Catholic mission is that we need to respect the dignity of each and every member of our community. And that means helping each other flourish to our absolute fullest potential. And we strive to do that, we can always be better. For our students, that means helping to enrich their lives and challenge them. For our faculty members, that means providing the mentoring and support that they need to succeed here. And for our staff, that means providing them the tools to develop professionally to their fullest potential. And we try to do all of those things, we can be better at everyone. We often talk about the Notre Dame experience, but the truth remains that students with fewer economic resources have a fundamentally different experience of Notre Dame than their more fortunate peers do. The university can do more to support students of low-income backgrounds to make sure that we all have the opportunity to succeed. If I can go back over 20 years ago, it was to me, I started off at the Morris Inn and we had more females there. And it's a good thing now that we have more males and females. It's just like equal. And we all come together to get our job done when the task comes. Well, I think fostering a community that embraces our differences and really cultivates a sense of belonging for everybody. I think that's, that's in our very foundation as a Catholic institution. And I, I, I see the response to Father Ted's passing and the review of his legacy as a really opportune time for us to refocus and recommit ourselves to continuing that legacy. I think we all need to try harder. I think we need to recognize that differences are good and be able to articulate that. So the reason diversity is important not just a, a means to an end. It's not a numbers game. Um, it is because uh, we're a better community. Um, we're stronger, um, the more diverse and inclusive we can be. This campus is full of incredibly amazing and talented people and so often we find ourselves so focused on ourselves and the places that we have to go and the things that we have to do. But it's so important for us to stop being so apathetic and care about the people around us and how important each person is here at Notre Dame and how different we all are. Building an inclusive workforce or an inclusive environment is more than just having simply basic representation. This is about having a voice in addition to a seat at that table. We talk about the differences that we have amongst us and whatnot. And then we also see opportunities where, where, that, where that voice is cultivated and brought in to help steer what we're doing programmatically. So it's incumbent upon us as leaders where we use our personal influence to help mentor and create those moments where that shift in our culture actually happens. I'm John McGreevy, I'm Dean of the College of Arts and Letters. I'm thrilled to be here this afternoon uh, as the moderator of a star-studded panel to help us think through these challenging issues of diversity and inclusion at Notre Dame. On my immediate left is Stephen Waller, who is a senior uh, at Notre Dame, and he is a double major in electrical engineering and economics. On his left is Jennifer Mason McElwert, a 1994 graduate of Notre Dame, now a faculty member in the law school, and also the director of the Center for Civil and Human Rights. On my right is Katie Washington Cole, who's been making us proud at Notre Dame for a long time. She is the 2010 uh, valedictorian, and now uh, living in Baltimore and getting an MD, and I believe just received her PhD at Johns Hopkins University. On her right is Luis Fraga, professor of political science and co-director of the Institute for Latino Studies. Please, let's begin by giving a round of applause to our brave panelists. Oh, 
Okay, now let's get to work. Uh, I'm going to start with Katie. Katie, when you reflect on your experience at Notre Dame, how did the university help cultivate an appreciation of diversity and inclusion in your time here, and maybe even now in your time on the Board of Trustees where you're a member, and, and where did Notre Dame fall down? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if I can kind of give a two-part answer. Um, first, I just sort of want to think broadly about what are the conversations that are being had across American universities and at the highest levels of our government. So now we have this case um, in the Supreme Court with the University of Texas where a young woman who um, felt that she wasn't accepted to the University of Texas at Austin because there were black and Latino students who had worse grades than her who were accepted. Um, and when people plugged the numbers, they found, yes, there were five African-American and Latino students who had grades and or SAT scores that were slightly lower than um, this particular student. However, um, there was a lot of focus, and there can be a lot of focus on these students, um, but there hasn't been very much of a conversation about the 42 white applicants to the University of Texas who were admitted to um, the class when this particular student or applicant was not, or the 168 African American and Latino applicants who were not accepted, who had just as good grades or better um, grades and SAT scores as the young woman. And the other conversations that we aren't having are about how 65% of African American children are raised in homes that are in the bottom quintile of income, where that number for white Americans is 11%. We aren't having conversations about how people in the middle quintile, African Americans, their children are, um, of seven in 10 of their children are then going to be in the bottom two quintiles of income in America. We are, where I am in graduate school in Baltimore, we're not talking about how African Americans are paying $15,000 more on average in fees and interest on their mortgages for their homes, and that number is even bigger if you are an upper income African American person in Baltimore. And these are the, a lot of times we want to talk about, okay, are there five African American or Latino students who are uh, getting in when there are you know, other white students or other, um, you know, we want to talk about those things, but there are other numbers, conversations that we aren't necessarily wanting to have. On the bright side, when I think about my Notre Dame experience, I think the idea of our Catholic character as an institution and our Catholic identity, we are compelled to ask the question of what is it that we should be aspiring to and how should we be introducing and having these conversations? And that is the kind of question that Martin Luther King asked himself all his life. What does my faith compel me to do? Those are the conversations that inspired me when I was one of the few non-Catholic Catholic social tradition minors um, in my class, and we were reading church documents and learning, okay, what are the things that the church fathers wanted us to be talking about? What were the conversations we should be having? And so it's not just about you know Catholics having conversation with Catholics, but it's also Catholics and Protestants, and it's not just Christians, it's also Christians and people who practice Islam and Judaism. It's not just people of faith, but those who profess no faith. And it's being able to allow our faith, our um, families, our backgrounds inspire us to engage in conversations about things that matter, um, while not getting bogged down in some of the things that truthfully even bogged down the, the highest levels of our government. So Katie, let me press you for a second. Yes. You look back on your experience, mm -hmm. what, what could Notre Dame have done better? Yeah. So when I think about it, and this is something I was talking to Stephen about, you started to get a long view, even only being five, five years out. And I remember sitting with Father John and Francis Javers, who was his uh, chief of staff at the time, and saying, we really should do something for MLK Day, and we should make it a huge affair, and it would be so fantastic. And at the time, we didn't necessarily have all the resources, we didn't have all the ideas, and here we are today in this room, and for the rest of the week, there are events slated that will celebrate um, Dr. King's life and legacy. Um, so taking a long view and um, something that Reverend Page said about um, the arc of the universe bends mm -hmm. towards justice, I think we just kind of have to keep bending that arc. And I think we can't be afraid to have the tough conversations. And I think we shouldn't get stopped at 
one sort of sound bite of data if it's like five African American students and Latino students got admitted when I didn't or some, and this is the argument that the Supreme Court is literally discussing right now. We shouldn't stop there and we should be asking ourselves, and that's the, the, the importance of bringing diverse groups of people into the classroom onto the faculty because then we can talk about the 65% of black children who are being raised in the bottom quintile. Stephen, does this seem familiar to you as a current Notre Dame student or would you describe your experiences differently than Katie would? Um, I would describe my experiences similar to what Katie would describe hers. I think that coming into the university, you experience a lot, or I personally experience a lot of discomfort um, because of me walking into my classes and being one of the only students of color in those classes, um, walking into seminars and the topic of race come up and me feeling like I have to defend my race. And those things really made me um, very uncomfortable, but I think that the university um, is doing really good and making really good strides to have those conversations and improve things on campus. If you even look from my freshman year to now, um, the way that they revamped the freshman orientation to Welcome Weekend and the way that we are having this conversation now and the way that we're having all these events for Martin Luther King, um, you think about how much the Student Diversity Council has improved um, and the way some conversations are coming up that weren't coming up before. So I think that um, it is appropriate to keep bending, and I think that uh, we're going in the right direction. Okay. Luis, you have a kind of interesting vantage point on Notre Dame. You were a faculty member in the 1990s. You made the tragic mistake of leaving and going <laughs> to Stanford and then to the University of Washington, but then we were able to lure you back. Does the Notre Dame of 25 years ago seem different than the Notre Dame now? How would you contrast them? What's been your experience in, in the two years since you've returned to the faculty? Notre Dame is, a, in my view, a very different institution now than it was um, 25 years ago. Um, the willingness of the university to build on the legacy of Dr. King to constantly provide spaces for a call to conscience, the willingness of the university, just as we're doing here on this panel, to ask hard questions, to commit its resources, to try to do better than it's done in the past, to build an institution of inclusion, is it's not that the university wasn't committed before, it's that it's more apparent where that commitment is today. When the university gave me the opportunity to come back to help it further enrich our Institute for Latino Studies, I had been given opportunities like that at many other institutions around the country, and I had worked hard to try to promote diversity and inclusion at other institutions around the country where I'd been a faculty member, such as you said. But what's different about Notre Dame is that this commitment is part of its original mission. The purpose of Notre Dame, the purpose, frankly, of Catholic education in the United States was to provide opportunity to those who were disadvantaged, who were being discriminated against, who were predominantly immigrant, who were predominantly poor. The chance that Notre Dame is taking and the commitment that it has made to recommit itself to its original mission by having conversations like this, by building an institute of Latino studies, by trying to continue to diversify its student body and its faculty and its staff, is Notre Dame actually re-embracing what has brought it the success and the greatness that we all have the opportunity to take advantage of today. To be a practicing Catholic and to have the chance to see whether or not I and my family can walk the walk, can make actual contributions to this recommitment is in a sense a prayer that is answered for me but it is a tremendous challenge that I think the institution is willing to take. So let me play devil's advocate for a second. Luis and, and Katie or anyone else can jump in too. Uh, some people might say the very fact that Notre Dame is a Catholic institution limits its ability to be a diverse and welcoming and inclusive community. Is that right? Um, it depends upon your particular view of, of what is allowed under Catholic social teaching and Catholic social thought. In my interpretation, and I think the interpretation of many serious scholars of Catholic social tradition, 
and thought, and especially Catholic social justice, the idea of inclusion is not restricted just to Catholics or primarily to Catholics. Jesus was about, and the gospel is about, bringing all people to understand the goodness of what it is that God has to offer us. Notre Dame has to maintain, in my view, its own Catholic identity, but it doesn't have to use it as a way of limiting its capacity to understand, to teach, to bring in, to empower, to be challenged by those who might come from different faith traditions or different perspectives regarding the values that currently dominate our Catholic faith. I think it's the questioning that is key to our Catholic tradition. And Notre Dame, in my view, has always embraced a willingness to question if it is to grow, to learn, to understand. Katie, do you agree with Luis? I have to say I agree in um, an additional perspective thinking about numbers, because that's where I started today. Um, I think it, would, it is a valuable and instructive lesson to look at some of our Catholic peers. There are universities that are also Catholic and who have maintained their Catholic character and identity, whose student bodies, faculties, uh, faculty um, in different departments are, in terms of the numbers, more ethnically diverse. And so to take a look at that and to say, what, is, what are these universities doing and what are we doing and how do we learn from our peers and their recruitment, their outreach, their retention policies and programs um, at all levels of the, at the institution, but um, I think what you said sort of brings the, um, what's the animus behind, because we don't want to get, again, bogged down in just making it about the numbers, but what kind of community are we building? What is the, the, the little C Catholic, the universal, um, and, and um, appreciating the gifts in, in, in unity and diversity in the body of Christ? Jennifer, you have the unusual vantage point of having been an undergraduate in Notre Dame, then went away and now come back as a law school faculty member, but also the director of the Center for Civil and Human Rights, which was founded by Father Hesburgh, precisely in some ways to address these issues. Give me your sense of where we are in terms of diversity and inclusion. When I graduated 22, almost 22 years ago, um, I had a tremendous experience, but it wasn't perfect. When I graduated, I had no friends who were persons of color. I didn't know a single openly gay person, and my class was capped at fewer than 40% women. And most egregiously, I think, I wasn't educated to think about those things as problems. Um, but here we are today having this conversation. Times have changed. I have grown. Notre Dame has grown. And from my vantage point as a faculty member, I can look at my students and see that we've made progress. I can also look at my students and see we haven't made enough progress. Um, but I do know that having students of different backgrounds and with different perspectives truly enhances our educational offerings. Um, I also know that diversity itself is not enough if you don't also have a spirit of inclusion. Um, to hear that students don't totally feel comfortable when they walk into class at Notre Dame means that we are failing at a very basic level. Um, community is at the heart of what we prize at Notre Dame. Um, and our job as faculty and staff and administrators is to build up that community, be a place that welcomes people of different backgrounds and different perspectives, makes it a safe place for them to be who they are and to articulate those perspectives. Um, and so um, inclusion is important, prizing difference is important, but also molding people and training people and teaching them that there's a certain commonality that's the most important of all, that each of us was created in the image of God and that each of us deserves a basic measure of human dignity, um, one and the same. Stephen, does what Jennifer said ring true to you now that on the one hand, we could say a thousand students crowded into the main building last night to begin this celebration of Martin Luther King Day and, and all the events of this week, that's a positive. But Jennifer said she graduated from Notre Dame and didn't really have a single friendship, a deep friendship with, with a student of color. And, and so you could imagine there were students of color at Notre Dame, but they weren't really connecting, at least with Jennifer and her friends. Is it better, are there more relationships across these ethnic divides now than there were 25 years ago? 
I think there are more friendships across, across ethnic divides. Um, I think that that's something that's definitely improving over the years, but something that can definitely be improving. Um, I think what something that you were saying about you not um, being educated to you know, have those conversations when you were undergrad, I think there are still a lot of students at Notre Dame that are not being educated um, to have these kinds of conversations and to care about these issues um, because you, you have a lot of students like at events like the March for um, MLK last night, but then there are also some events where you won't have, you know, a lot of students of the majority that will show up um, and that will be, you know, active and concerned about these issues. Um, I went to a panel a couple months ago specifically where um, all the students there were of color. I think there were one or two students of the majority and one of the topics that came up at this panel was how do you get students to, of the majority to be concerned and to be, you know, active um, about these issues. So I'm going to interrupt you. I want the panel to think about how do we do that? How do we get students who are, our students, faculty, and staff who are in the majority, that is who are white, to care about these issues? Anyone? One way, I, I'm going to suggest two ways. Okay. Um, hiring more diverse faculty is important. Better is hiring a faculty who are committed to bringing diversity within their intellectual work. Better is, in fact, giving our students in their intellectual development more of an opportunity to have these chances at self-reflection. Similarly, for our students, it's very important that we discuss issues related to diversity and inclusion, as we have, I think, on this panel, as not just something that is of interest to the students of color. It is of interest to the entire community because it's of interest to their children, to our children, and to their grandchildren, because all the numbers indicate that we're only becoming more and more of a diverse nation. All of the numbers indicate that we're becoming more and more globally intertwined with each other. And we are letting our students down and ourselves down and what we treasure most, the next generations down, if we don't maximize their opportunities to think about these issues seriously and ask the hard questions of sacrifice, of distribution of resources, of how you build bridges of understanding where they have not been there before. Ask ourselves the hard question, the hard questions in all of our classes, not just in classes that are specifically devoted to these issues. Jennifer, what do you think of that? I think it's just important also to frame this as core to our Catholic identity. I don't think that there's Absolutely. any conflict Absolutely. between um, a push for diversity and inclusion and our Catholic identity. In fact, I think that it is integral to who we are. Um, we are all made in the image of God. Human dignity, advancing human dignity, is the reason that Notre Dame exists. That is what we are meant to do as a Catholic university. We can do that within our own community. We can be that presence to the world. And to pull something that both of you said together, you know, the Catholic Church has grown in recent years the most in Latin America and across the continent of Africa. And so to be responsive, to, and I think that's something that, you know, you see with our current Pope, Pope Francis, understanding that the, the church is global. And um, from a pastoral perspective, but also from the perspective of being young people and faculty members and staff, um, going out, we, we are in a more diverse uh, a, and more global world. And so it is critical to one's personal, professional, and other kinds of development, spiritual development, to um, contextualize one's experiences within the broader context of a more global and diverse um, and hopefully inclusive world. Okay, I, we're getting near the end of time, and so I want you each uh, I'm going to ask you, what's something that you would love to see happen at Notre Dame in the next five years to make this a more just and inclusive community? We're just going to go around the table here. Jennifer. Everybody on their table has that picture of Martin Luther King with Father Ted Hesburgh. And I think what we need to do is we need to identify the new Martin Luther Kings of this era. I think we are having a great national conversation, and we're seeing the advent of a new civil rights movement. Who are the Martin Luther Kings of today, and how is Notre Dame going to join hands with them? What are we going to do? And how do we do that at Notre Dame? We ask the questions. We hire more diverse faculty. 
faculty that care about civil and human rights. That will set a tone that Notre Dame cares about these things. It will engage the university with this great national conversation, and it will educate our students' minds and hearts in a way that we have promised to do so. So if you think about the national conversation around Black Lives Matter, immigration, economic inequality, your answer is we need more diverse faculty and we need more conversations in the classrooms and residence halls to generate Notre Dame's contribution to that national conversation. Absolutely, I think we need to be intellectual leaders in the yes. conversation and we need to be providing a moral voice in that conversation as well. Stephen, five years out. Five years out. I think the main thing that I would like to see is an increase in you know, student body um, prevalence within issues of diversity and inclusion on campus. And I think that starts with education um, and you know, teaching inclusiveness in classrooms around Notre Dame and making sure that you know, everyone cares about these issues and everyone knows how important these issues are. Because I believe that if more people are educated about these issues, um, more change can happen. Okay. Katie. I, you know, Jennifer sort of really touched on a lot of what I've been thinking about in terms of the national conversation about race. There are a number of high profile stories that have brought um, our attention more and more to these issues that um, have a lot of importance and value in understanding our history. And I think that Notre Dame should be cultivating leaders in this conversation nationwide. Um, I think that Notre Dame should be um, very substantive in applying our Catholic character to our analysis of and then response to um, all of the issues that we've been talking about today. Because I think that Notre Dame being a Catholic university can add so much value to a conversation that can become very much divided along political lines and, and other issues. It's like there is so much value that can come from scripture and from tradition and the way that um, a Catholic education teaches you to um, approach problems, not in a way that is just, um, again, political or along other types of divides, but really concerning the heart and matters of the spirit and matters of what it is that we should be doing as members of the body of Christ. And I would love to see those brought, those, that type of thinking brought to bear on the types of things that I was talking about earlier, 65% of black children being raised in houses in the bottom quintile. I would like to see that as it relates to immigration and the conversations that we're having about um, all kinds of turmoil in places like El Salvador and Honduras. And I think it's very important for us to be cultivating leaders to, to have those discussions and to um, really be engaged and really have some substantive, substantive response that uh, grows and flourishes from our Catholic character as an institution. Luis, five years out. Five years down, I hope that Notre Dame, and will work for Notre Dame, to be the nation's center for moral self-reflection. Mm. Let me tell you a little bit of, of what I mean by that. I, I think we don't have to look too far to see how much progress we still have to make as a nation in using rhetoric that displays dignity, respect, trust, and love. When you see what the nature of elements of our national political discourse are now and those who would aspire to be our national political leaders, we have to be a place where people look to not just our faculty and our students, but to be a place that brings together people from all different types of communities to have a safe space for that moral self-reflection where each of the participants has the chance to reflect on their own sense of what it means to be a human, what it means to love, what it means to commit oneself to others. One of the most famous quotes, and there are many, that I um, find comfort in from the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King is that it is not until night is at its darkest that you can see the stars. So it's at times of questioning, at times of doubt, at times when we're not sure what to do, that we have the opportunity to reach our highest ideals. What if Notre Dame became the place where 
students from around the country, if not the world, where faculty from around the country, if not the world, where administrators had the chance to ask the hard questions. Because Notre Dame is a place, not just that provides space, that will, but will provide the understanding, the, the support, and establish a culture of love and understanding that allows for that self-reflection to actually lead to a different way of thinking and of doing. Thank you. These panelists were uh, not volunteers. They were drafted. <laughs> uh, and they all agreed willingly to serve on what Father Jenkins' common journey of purpose. Please join me in giving them a heartfelt round of applause for their conversation today. Thank you, Dean McGreevy, Dr. Washington Cole, Professor Fraga, Professor McAward, and Mr. Waller for sharing your perspectives with us. You have certainly given us much to think about as we consider our next steps in walking our walk. Friends, as our time together draws to a close, I would like to thank everyone that has worked visibly and behind the scenes to make this event possible. Members of the President's Office, our food services personnel, our Joyce Center staff, and a host of others too numerous to mention. Please join me in giving them a very warm round of applause. I would also like to thank all who have joined us here today in person or by means of our live feed and invite you to be a part of all of our Walk the Walk events throughout this week. Our work to advance the vision of Dr. King at Notre Dame and to make ours a more welcoming and inclusive Notre Dame is ongoing. Now it is incumbent upon us individually and collectively to act. Therefore, let us pause for a moment of silence before our benediction to consider those steps that we can take, those steps that we should take, those steps that we must take. and compassion. We thank you for the witness of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., whose life and teachings remind us of the mission to which we have been called, a mission to be prophets that speak truth to power and challenge hatred and despair, a mission to be agents of reconciliation, healing longstanding wounds and sowing seeds of peace a mission to be ambassadors of hope, of redemption, of new beginnings. Inspire and empower us to venture forth boldly as people of faith and conscience, capable of walking that all-important walk toward justice and the creation of our campus community on our campus community, of a community, a people, more fully open welcoming, and inclusive. We ask these things trusting in your ineffable and boundless love, through which all things are possible. May that love be our inspiration, our solace, and our guide in each step that we take, now and always. Let us say together, amen. Thank you all once again for being here.